This is kind of a grilling room here this morning. You need them? Okay. <laughs> Problem is, it makes it difficult down here. Pete was having trouble last night reading his notes, too. But he's better at ad-libbing than I am. Is there an echo? Yeah, just a little bit. Perhaps we could turn one of them down just, just a little bit. Do you, is it okay now? I need to pull you back. Oh, we may be short, short a cable here. No, that's this lady here. She has a, has a hearing problem. Yeah, once you, can you move down here? Yeah, good. That's a girl. Can you hear me all right now, ma'am? Can you hear me all right? That's here? You know, <clears throat> I want to answer that. <clears throat> Everybody... Uh, it, it has come to me and say, how come you take all of this bald-headed stuff? I mean, everybody is teasing you, particularly Pete is teasing you about being bald-headed. Well, it really has been a conspiracy all this time. <laughs> Actually, it's a part of a charade that Pete and I have going. You see, I'm the straight guy, and Pete's the comic. <laughs> and so he's always pulling these straight jokes on me, you know, with my bald head and so forth. But actually, I have a very full head of real pretty blonde hair to go with my Saxon blue eyes. I, I shave it off every day like Kojak's and Yo Brenner just to be a part of this charade. So now you know. Okay, we ready? Is the camera ready? Okay, good. Good morning. Perhaps the two most confusing issues in all of Christianity today are the issues of the law still being in effect and the timing of the kingdom of God. We in identity don't have a problem with the laws. All of, us, we know, all of us know that they're still in effect. But most of us have come out of the denominations with a doctrinal baggage on the timing. The timing of the kingdom has been hanging around our neck like a millstone. This debate has gone on for centuries. We need to forget somehow if we could just totally erase the doctrines that we have learned in the denominations. We need to take a serious, very serious look at what the Word of God says and forget what the seminaries have trained our preachers and us. We have to <clears throat> realize that of these two issues, and it was pointed out just this very morning, that perhaps the timing of the kingdom is even more important than the Mosaic laws because the Mosaic laws are here in our heart, Jeremiah 31 and Hebrews 8. They're here, so we don't have to read those laws every year as we did once while we were in the wilderness in Israel. So the timing of that kingdom, what it means, are we in it or aren't we in it, that is the most important issue before us today. It's been addressed several times. Brother Ted has uh, done some good work on this. Uh, <clears throat> Brueggemann has done some uh, good work on it. Uh, Ted's uh, points of uh, view are, uh, are his way of presenting it is going to be a little bit different than what we are doing here today. I want to approach this from a different point of view and try to once again, I did this once before a couple years ago, once again try to get us to understand the timing of the Christian kingdom of God. 
The basic question is whether the Christian kingdom of God is to be in the future or whether we have been ruling with Christ in the kingdom for nearly 2,000 years. And as I pointed out to you, the, all of us as a people, our lives, our future, all depends on this. The existence of Christianity today, the Christian kingdom, uh, rests on this question. Turn with me, if you will, to Exodus 19, and it is here that we see the evidence of God creating the theocracy that we call the kingdom of God. Starting in verse 2, in Exodus chapter 19. For they were departed from Rephidim, and were come to the desert of Sinai, and had pitched in the wilderness, and there Israel camped before the mount. And Moses went up unto God, and the Lord called unto him out of the mountain, saying, thou shalt, thou shalt thou, Thus shalt thou say to the house of Jacob, and tell the children of Israel, Ye have seen what I have did, done unto the Egyptians, and how I bear you on eagles' wings, and brought you unto myself. And ye shall be unto me a kingdom of priests. Now that's New Testament theology. A kingdom of priests and an holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. Move on down now to verse 5. Now therefore, if ye will obey my voice indeed, and keep my covenant, then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people, for all the earth is mine. So we have a covenant, and the covenant is related to the kingdom. As long as Israel obeyed the laws of God, they would retain that covenant, and they would retain that kingdom. Shortly after that, God told, Mo told Moses to give the children of the Israel the Ten Commandments, which he did. It's the basis of the kingdom. You might say the constitution of the kingdom. From that, we know that the laws, the statutes, and the judgments to complement those Ten Commandments, judication, as you would, to those Ten Commandments were given. These actions provided the framework for the kingdom of God. The fact that we had the Ten Commandments, the law, statutes, and judgments, the way to adjudicate those laws of God gave us the framework for the kingdom of God. And as long as we obeyed that, we retained that covenant. And when we disobeyed it, we will have lost that covenant and that kingdom. We know that Israel then went on and to become disenchanted with the theocracy that God had given us. And they wanted a king that they could see and that they could touch that they could worship here, looking at him eyeball to eyeball, just like all of the other non-Israel nations that were around them. God permitted it, but he had warned Israel of the consequences. What would happen when you had this earthly king? We know that the two houses split into two kingdoms. The northern ten tribes known as the House of Israel, with their headquarters in Samaria. The tribes of Judah and Benjamin, known as the Southern Kingdom, had their headquarters in Jerusalem. We know what happened, but I must go through this just as a very quick review in order to establish the setting for the timing of the Kingdom of God. The ten northern tribes continued in sin, so much so that God divorced them. They were taken into captivity by King Sennacherib, taken to Assyria, where they stayed about 100 years, and then they escaped into Europe, where they worshiped their foreign gods, just like Hosea said you would do. Put into deep freeze, as it were. 
That's what God did with us. He put us out there in deep freeze so that he would call on us when the time was right for him to do so. He was to bring us out when he was ready for it. What that means is that the kingdom was taken away from the ten northern tribes. They lost the kingdom of God. They were no longer a kingdom of priests. They didn't keep their part of the covenant. It is just as simple as that. When we keep the covenant with God, we will have kept the kingdom. We didn't, and we lost it. The kingdom wasn't taken from Judah and Benjamin. The covenant was still in force. It wasn't because Judah and Benjamin were so righteous or so obedient but he kept the covenant because he knew what was to happen just a few hundred years later. He kept that covenant. Judah continued to sin. God placed him in bondage in Babylon. And all they did was to learn about the Babylonian Talmud. And that's very important with what, it, what is about to take place in our discussion. If you came back to Jerusalem, and through the years, they mixed with the Hittites, the Ammonites, the Edomites, and all of the other ites in the, in the area. They kept their Babylonian Talmud, however, and they continued to develop it into the complicated and evil document it is today. But Judah still had the covenant. Again, not because they were so righteous. They weren't righteous. But God had to keep that covenant in effect. There had to be that kingdom. That covenant was kept right up until the time of Christ Jesus and his birth. Christ was born right at the time of the peak of the power of the Pharisees. The Pharisaical system was at its apex at the time of the birth of Christ. And that Pharisaical con concept came from the Babylonian Talmud. That Babylonian Talmud that was taught in Babylon was the basis of that Pharisaical concept. And we know what the Phariseeism, it, Phariseeism is. There's no need right at the moment to discuss that. God knew that it was time. A time of judgment and a time for recovery. The kingdom of priests was again going to change hands. There was something big about to happen. And the entire gospel of the kingdom is relative to what was about to happen. God didn't present himself in the same way when he removed his covenant with the ten northern tribes. He told them he was going to do it. Hosea warned them. And Hosea was very accurate in his prophecies. And God did just exactly what he said he was going to do. But when he removed his covenant from Judah, he did it in a way that the people of this entire planet was to remember it forever, evermore. He kept putting up with Judah and that southern tribe. He kept that covenant there because it was a promise that he would. But when he did it, he did it with a big splash. And that also is very important to us. I needed to make that very fast trip through history in order to set the stage for the importance of the kingdom and the covenant that goes with it. The kingdom is related to the laws, statutes, and judgments. The covenant is related to keeping those laws, statutes, and judgments. Anything related to the same thing are related to each other. 
It's even an axiom in mathematics. So it is important for us to know and to remember that the covenant and the laws go together. The covenant and the kingdom go together. The laws, statutes, and judgments and the kingdom go together. Whoever keeps that covenant, whoever keeps those laws, statutes, and judgments will keep the kingdom. Someone in Israel is to have that covenant. God promised that he would never totally break the covenant. Turn with me to Leviticus 24 and in verse 44. Leviticus 24 and verse 44. God says this, And yet, for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, neither will I abhor them, to destroy them utterly. That means totally. I will not destroy them totally. And to break my covenant with them. He will always keep that covenant. It's a promise. For I am the Lord their God, but I will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors. He's remembering the covenant of our ancestors this very moment. When they brought forth out of the land of Egypt, in the land of the heathen, that I might be their God, I am the Lord. It is of the utmost importance to understand that the Christian kingdom of God is in effect. It is basic, probably the most central part to all of the identity belief. Knowing that we are Israel and knowing that when the kingdom message leaves us in about the, uh, knowing, uh, knowing the when of the kingdom message leaves us in about the same place of all as all of the rest of Judeo-Christianity. If we don't understand the timing of the kingdom, we are in no better position than all of the rest of the denominations. We're in the same deep problem that they're in. In Matthew 21, in verse 43, Jesus told the Pharisees and the chief priests among the Jews, he said this, Therefore say, say I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you and given to a, a nation bringing forth the fruits thereof. The question we must answer to that verse is this. When was it taken from the Jews and when was it given to Christian Israel? Was there to be a long period of time between the two? If there was, then God broke his promise. So we have to consider it in that light. Think about carefully about these questions. Turn to Malachi chapter 4. We will start here in our attempt to explain the kingdom or to explain the day of salvation for Israel. Malachi chapter 4. We'll read starting in verse 4. Remember ye the law of Moses my servant, which I commanded unto him in Horeb for all Israel, with the statutes and the judgments. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Note that in these verses, the law, statutes, and judgments are tied to the prophet Elijah preceding the Messiah's coming. Those laws, statutes, and judgments must of a certainty go together with the kingdom. God stated that at Mount Sinai and Malachi is again confirming it. Now turn again to, uh, turn with me to Luke 1, chapter, uh, verse 13. Luke 1, verse 13. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. Good, thank you. Good, thank you. Yeah. 
Now drop on down to verse 17. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. There are perhaps here right now many people who will think that these verses really don't say that John the Baptist is, was, Elijah. What does Jesus say about this in his message to his disciples? Turn to Matthew chapter 11. Here Jesus is talking to the multitudes and to his disciples about John the Baptist, who is at this time already in prison. John the Baptist had already gone preaching the kingdom is at hand, repent. And he was already put into prison for it. And here is what Jesus the Christ had to say, starting in verse 8. But what went ye, went ye out for to see? A man clothed in soft raiment? Behold, they that wear soft raiment are in kings' houses. But what went ye out to see? Yea, I say unto you, and more than a prophet, for this is he of whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger before my face, before thy face, which shall prepare the way before thee. Verily I say unto you, among them that are born of women, there has not risen a greater than John the Baptist, notwithstanding he that is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. Keep that in mind. And the violent take it by force. Keep that in mind. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if ye will receive it, this is Elias or Elijah, which was for to come. Now, the New International version, ver, version renders verse 12 in this manner. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing. The Christian kingdom of God has been forcefully advancing. And forceful men lay hold of it. Now, these are key words as to what was happening in this violent period of time. There was an upheaval taking place of such magnitude that the world was never, ever to forget it. You see, they there had trouble understanding the importance of this, just like we do today. Here it was. The kingdom of God was changing hands right there before them and the people wouldn't believe it. And there hasn't been a change in that attitude since. Some do, some don't. The kingdom was forcefully advancing because said, God said it was time. Elijah was sent to Israel as was promised. The Messiah was sent to Israel just as was promised. The Talmudic Pharisees, with their oral laws, their Pharisaical oral laws of their Talmud, had totally destroyed, totally destroyed, the laws, statutes, and judgments of God, which is integral with the kingdom. We've already discussed that. The forceful men who lay hold of it were those Pharisees and their priests. They were trying to prevent this from happening, wouldn't you? They were in command of the kingdom. They were the apex of the kingdom. They had the covenant, even though they didn't deserve it one iota. And so those forceful men, and they were forceful, look what they did to all of the apostles. Look what they did to our God. That is how... Uh, this entire situation, how forceful, how these forceful men had a hold of that kingdom and they weren't going to turn it loose. You see, the fight was between the Pharisees and the Christian Israel. 
God uses men to do his will. Just as God is using men in this very time, in this very building right now, to do his will. We must go forth from this meeting to preach these things, to teach these things to our brothers and sisters out there. We must get our people to understand the concept, the gospel of the kingdom. What do you think the gospel of the kingdom is? It's there. Take it. Turn quickly now to Matthew chapter 17. Starting in verse 10, we read this. And his disciples asked him, saying, Why then say the scribes that, uh, say the scribes that Elias must come first? And Jesus answered and said unto them, Elias truly shall come first and restore all things. But I say unto you that Elias has come already, and they knew him not, but have done unto him whatsoever they listed. Likewise shall also the Son of Man suffer of them. And the disciples understood that he spake unto them of John the Baptist. Forceful men were laying hold and retaining the control of that kingdom. But God was in command. As we had read in Malachi, Elijah was to come before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. We never seem to think that the coming of the Messiah to save us from our enemies and those who hate us, as it's described in Luke 1, the latter portions of the chapter, as the dreadful day of the Lord. It's hard for us to understand that this little baby in swaddling clothes was the coming of the dreadful day of the Lord. But it was a dreadful period. There was a recovering, a recovering that was to take place and that a different people was to be given the Christian kingdom or the kingdom of God. And a different people were to be a kingdom of priests. That, act, that scripture, I believe, accurately describes what was stated that come, started in motion by the coming of the Christ. We here 2,000 years later find it difficult to fully realize just what happened to the whole planet during that period of time. God did not want a system of government called Talmudic Phariseeism to be the guiding light to the whole earth, to all of the people of the earth. He removed it and placed it with the Christian kingdom concept. If we would study the history of the world, we would realize the fantastic blessings. And I don't believe that there's a person here that won't agree with me with this. The fantastic blessings that this world has realized and understood because of the Christian presence on earth. There is nobody that will deny that the world is much better off for the Christian concept having been here. Now that to me is a powerful reason to believing that there has been a Christian kingdom of God and that there has been a kingdom of priests all of these years. If we are a better off people all over the world, all of the races of the world are better off because we were here, in spite of what they're teaching us today. The Christian, Christian Israel hasn't exploited these people totally. Certain people within Christian Israel has exploited these people, but who are they? You and I haven't exploited these other peoples. We are the kingdom of priests. And those people up there who did exploit the other people wouldn't have done so had you and I understood we were a kingdom of priests and we were in the kingdom and we wouldn't allow them to do it. And we were ruling with Christ. Amen. They would never have gotten by with it. And you would never have a one world order concept being thrust down our throats right now if we were a kingdom of priests and we believed we were in the kingdom of Christ and we knew that we had the covenant and we demanded that they turn it loose or we'll hang you. 
Now that's where we are. It's that important for us to misunderstanding, misunderstand the kingdom of God and a kingdom of priests. Just as the people didn't understand the importance of what was happening all around them, the apostles were having trouble too. They didn't understand it either. Jesus was nurturing them and preparing them for the work they shortly had to do. Turn with me, if you will, to Matthew 24. Jesus has returned to Jerusalem. He had entered the temple and he had scourged the money changers with his scourge that he made himself. He drew blood with that scourge because the scourge by definition was really what we would call a cat and nine tails today and the end of each one of those leather thongs was a bone. And our Jesus the Christ made that scourge. He overturned the tables. He has told the multitude and the disciples of the evils of the kingdom being controlled by the Pharisees. He has told them that their house is left unto them desolate. Starting in verse 1, Matthew 24. And Jesus went out and departed from the temple. And his disciples came to him for to show him the building of the temple. And Jesus said unto them, See ye not all these things? Verily I say unto you, There shall not be left one stone upon another that shall not be thrown down. And as he sat down upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. God was talking to the disciples privately, saying, he, they asked him, Tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? The word coming there is the Greek word parousia. It isn't coming at all. It's presence. It means presence. When is the sign of thy presence and the end of the world? See, they didn't know that the kingdom would be when it would be, and they still didn't know at the time of the resurrection. They didn't know. Turn with me now to the first chapter of Acts, starting in verse 1. And I apologize for moving on rapidly here because we have to do so. Reading down through verse 8, starting with verse 1. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that he threw the Holy Ghost. He through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen. So it was after his resurrection that much of the information that they were to, to go forth and preach and teach was given to them. To whom also he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promises of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. So the information that they were to receive was to come to them very shortly. When they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. Ye shall receive power in the future. After that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Now that's a great big area, isn't it? Or is it? It's a very key point as to what we are studying here today. They still didn't know exactly when, and God had his own purposes. And perhaps 
In my mind, it might have been for security reasons. Supposing they knew exactly when the act was to take place, when this dreadful day of the Lord was to take place, they could have perhaps uh, countered it, and it may not have worked out the same. But he didn't tell them when it was to be. Jesus had told them enough to allow them to prepare the believers. Jesus told them that they were to be given power and that they were to be witnesses even to the ends of the earth. Now, let's analyze the ends of the earth. It didn't mean Australia. It didn't mean Japan. It didn't mean South Africa nor the United States. That term, translated from the Greek, could have meant the planet, it could have meant a region or a country, or it could have meant the Roman Empire. And when we take those verses, or that verse, to the ends of the earth, the uttermost part of the earth, and relate it to other verses that I will want you to go and search out, they're there for you to see, the companion verses, you will see for yourself that we are talking about the Roman Empire. It wasn't Australia, it wasn't the United States, it wasn't Japan, it wasn't all of the Pacific Islands, etc. Because this was to take place eminently, and it was only the Roman Empire. But to them, it was the whole world. It was the uttermost parts of the earth. It was to all the nations. It was to the whole earth. It was to the whole world. Those were the terms that they used. But when you put them into context, when you put them as to what they were doing, they were talking about the Roman Empire. That confine there in the northern Africa regions into the, into the Near East, on up into, uh, into as far as, as Rome had gone, up into Europe, into Gaul and into parts of Germany, over into France, over into England. And now I tell you, what does history tell us where the apostles were? They were in that area. You take a look at any of the, the, the school days maps of, the, of where Apostle Paul went and so forth, except they don't even show that he went to England, but we know that he did. They do show that he went into Gaul or France, but that was all a part of the Roman Empire, so he had to mean the Roman Empire. In Romans 1 and verse 8, Paul, now having received the Holy Ghost and is witnessing just as, as Jesus directed him to do, says this, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole earth. Now you know and I know they, did, they weren't doing that here. They weren't doing it in South America. They weren't doing it in Australia. They were doing it there in the Roman Empire. In Romans 10 and verse 18, we read this, But I say, have they not heard? Yes, verily. Their sound went into all the earth, and their worlds, and, and their words unto the ends of the world. Paul and the rest of the apostles, as I had pointed out, had gone into that area that was controlled by the Roman Empire. Then Jesus said in Matthew 24 and in verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the kingdom, what is he trying to say? Shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. Jesus is talking about the ends of the kingdom of the Jewish Pharisees. They had command of the kingdom, they had the covenant, they were the kingdom of priests, and they exercised that power just unmercifully. They were totalitarian in that. They had made total non-effect of all of the laws, statutes, and judgments of God. Now to wrap up this part of the discussion, in Acts 2 and in verse 5, we read this. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men, 
out of every nation under heaven. This verse is describing devout Jews from the countries that made up the Roman Empire. The next question is that what, what were the apostles witnessing? What were they really witnessing? What were they to tell the people? The answer to that question gives us a very strong clue as to when the kingdom of God is to be ushered in. The Christian kingdom is to be ushered in and given back to Israel. All of the apostles were given comfort to the believers. And they were telling them that they needed to stay together and they needed to pray and they needed to have faith. In the fifth chapter of James, he is telling the rich men in verse 1, Go to now, ye rich men, weep and howl for your miseries that shall come upon you. Your riches are corrupted, and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver is cankered, and the rest of them shall be a witness against you, and shall eat your flesh as it were fire. Ye have heaped treasure together for the last days. Move on down to verse 8. Be ye also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another. Brethren, lest ye be condemned, behold, the judge standeth before the door. Now, what did those, a lot of those men, remember some of these people were very rich and wealthy people that come back from Babylon. They were very wealthy families. What did they learn how to do in Babylon? They learned stocks. They learned bonds. They had the quay down by the river where they set the price of, of commodities coming in and going out. They had insurance. They had banks that had 24, 25, 26 percent interest, usury, and so forth. They were wealthy men. They learned how to do it back at the same place they learned all about the Talmud. So there were rich men. And that who is who James was directing his message to. You rich men who had learned to get rich back there uh, in the Babylonian system of, uh, system of economics. You're rich, but you're, you're going to suffer for this. And so that is what he was saying. Turn with me now to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. Paul is telling the men that this is not a good time to marry. We've misunderstood Paul terribly on this issue. He is telling those who are already married to stay married. He is not telling us today that it's not good to get married. He's not telling us that. And yet so many of our people and, and our, our poor ladies among us uh, read Paul in total confusion because of, hey, what's wrong with marriage? What's wrong with motherhood? He's not telling our ladies that. He is saying right now is a bad time to be, married, uh, to, be, to be married. But if you are married, stay married. But if you're single, stay single. But if, you're, if you are uh, married, don't have children right now because there's a terrible day just about to happen. Isn't that what Jesus said? And he says, woe and be damned that are uh, with sucking with child. Isn't that what he said? All right, so Paul was simply relating back to that. We were talking about a terrible day that was about to take place. Something big was about to happen. In verse 26, I suppose, suppose therefore that this is good for the present distress, the present state of affairs all around us. I say that it is good for a man so to be. Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not to be loosed. Art thou loosed from a wife? Seek not a wife. But if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. He's trying to tell them this is a bad time to have children. But this I say, brethren, the time is short. It remaineth that both they that have wives be as though they had none. That meant no children. And they that weep as though they wept not. And they that rejoice 
as though they rejoice not, and they that buy as though they possess not, and they that use this world as not, abu and not, abuse as not abusing it for the fashion of this world passeth away. The New American Standard says this about that last phrase, the form of this world is passing, is passing away. It's imminent. It's there all around them. Just be careful. Do what you, what you need to do and no more. Think in terms of survival, just like I think today we must think in terms of survival. Matthew 24, starting in verse 14. He told them to take heed that no man deceive them. And then in verse 14, in this gospel, note that he is saying this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. And again, that meant the Roman Empire. For a witness unto all nations and they were out there witnessing, trying to tell them, just as Paul had said just a moment ago, this is a very distressful period of time. It was a witness to all the nations. And then shall the end come. This is describing the end of the Pharisaical system and is to be replaced with the Christian kingdom of God. When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet, Stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Now understand, when he didn't say that, whoso readeth, let him understand, because there was no, nothing to read at that moment. The New Testament hadn't been printed yet. And so that was added, and that's the reason for the parentheses, open and closing parentheses there in that verse, that part of the verse. Then let, then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountains. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house, neither let him which be in the fields return back to take his clothes. And woe unto them that are with child, and to them that give suck in those days. It's the same thing that Paul said. But pray ye that your flight not be in winter, neither on the Sabbath day, and <clears throat> for then shall the great tribulation, such as, that, such as was not since the beginning of the world, and this, to this time no, nor ever shall be. And again he's talking about the Roman Empire. He continues explaining what the situation will be like there in the Jerusalem area when the destruction of the headquarters of the Pharisaical system of uh, kingdom of, of God was to happen. Verse 30, And then shall appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, and then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And all of this happened, every bit of it, just as he said it would happen. The first Christ, Christian historian, Eusebius, he details in his book the history of the church. He talks about the details of what was happening in Jerusalem at the time. And he also said this in that book. He said that there was a vision given to all of the Christians in Jerusalem one night the leaders of the Christian groups in, in Jerusalem and in the area get out. And, and that vision told them to go to Pella, which is about 120 miles north and west, which they did. And they all survived. Now, it was a rough trek on them, 120 miles on foot. But they did it, and they made it, and they survived. The Christians knew that the kingdom was being taken from Pharisees, and it was being given to them. And they started the task of building the great Christian kingdom of God. The Jewish apocalyptic writers that it originated during the days of the Pharisees were reintroduced immediately. The Pharisees weren't taking their loss sitting down. They were going to fight immediately, and they did. It wasn't within but just years that there were more heresies, there were more cults, there were more people of different uh, discussions there in the Jerusalem area and in the eastern uh, uh, part of the Mediterranean area and up around Rome. There were cults galore talking about 
uh, the, the fact that this wasn't the Christian kingdom of God. There was a Jew by the name of Arius that came in and said, oh no, he was just a man. He was in the, he was in the bishopry of, of, of North Africa. Uh, and he said, no, he was just a man. And that's the reason you, you acquired the Nicene Creed that says, yes, the deity Christ is established. All right, now, they fought among themselves. But out in the boonies, they didn't have, they didn't have the Bible, because the Bible wasn't printed until 1400, and some after, uh, after the printing press was, uh, was invented. They had a few scrolls, but way out in the boonies, they never heard of this fight. And they went out there and they fought, and they fought with a sword, just like Jesus said they would, to build the Christian kingdom of God. And you are Christian today because those men and women and children believed it. They fought with a sword and, and, and like a tiger to build and create that Christian kingdom of God. But this thing that was creeping in, even then, was called chilea, uh, 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 chiliasm, was the name given to this whole system that no, the Christian kingdom is in the future. Premillennialism, if you would. That's in the future. We're not in the Christian kingdom of God, but it's all the way up here in the future. Chiliasm took place. But then there was a man by the name of Augustine. He wrote the book, The City of God. In my mind, he made one mistake. He called the church the kingdom. But no, the remnant was the kingdom. The ecclesia was the kingdom. We are all a part of the kingdom. We are all who have been repented and who have been baptized into Christ. We have touched his blood in the water in that act of baptism. We are the, his body here on earth and we rule with him. Next message, I'm going to tell you what has happened to us because we have believed all of these years in futurism. It's a sordid tale, but it's the truth. Thank you and God bless you.